Um, 244 years ago, this the end of August, the Continental Army was defeated at the Battle of Brooklyn, and it came close to complete destruction. It was the first major battle of the Revolutionary War, and the biggest. The Americans allowed themselves to be surrounded, and their army was nearly destroyed entirely. Only a desperate last stand, made up mostly of men from Maryland, a few from Delaware, um, who we now call the Maryland 400, held the British off long enough to prevent, to allow the rest of the Americans to escape. In the course of the battle, 256 Marylanders were either killed or captured. Since 2013, as Chris mentioned, I have led a project at the Maryland State Archives called Finding the Maryland 400, studying these soldiers from Maryland who fought with such courage and such renown on that day. We have been supported through a partnership with the Maryland Society of the Sons of the American Revolution, who have very generously funded this project for a number of years, um, as has Washington College over in Chestertown, who have been tremendous partners. And I'm very grateful to all of their help. The first thing that I should tell you about the project and about the Maryland 400 is that the name's wrong. And just, just right there, if you remember nothing else from today, the Maryland 400, the, name, the number is not right. There were not 400 soldiers there for Maryland. Um, Maryland 400 is a Victorian era term. It's either in allusion to the Spartan 300 who held back the Persians at the Battle of Thermopylae. Um, those are the guys from the movie or Possibly, and this is my personal uh, thought, is that it's a reference to Lady Astor's 400, the listing of New York High Society's most exclusive families from the Gilded Age. Um, and that's a term that comes into use in New York, the, the 400 or the New York 400, about the same time that Maryland 400 starts to be used. Um, and I have, I have seen a few explicit references saying, you know, New York is there 400, they're all those rich guys up there, the, the, the flashiest people in the city. Um, but in Maryland, our 400, our people who matter, are the ones who, who fought in the Revolutionary War. In truth, there were somewhere around a thousand soldiers from Maryland at the Battle of Brooklyn. We don't know how many of them there were um, exactly. We don't know everyone's name. There are many gaps in the records, um, both in terms of who enlisted and in who actually made it to the battle and in what happened to them at the battle. But using the muster rolls and enlistment records that have survived, as well as veterans' pensions, um, pay records, bits of random bits of correspondence, wills, other things like that, um, oral history in a few cases, um, we have been able to piece together 872 names, so 87% uh, more or less of the regiment. Um, we have everyone's name is listed on our website, the address right there on the screen. Um, and we have biographies of all of them written. So as you think about ways to explore your Revolutionary War ancestry, um, those are the kinds of records you can go from. Hopefully, if your ancestors fought later in the war, you'll have better sources. One thing that we discovered was that in 1776, this, the war had not been happening for very long. Um, and Maryland didn't really know how to raise and organize and administer an army. Um, and they had to figure it out, figure it out as they went. And they had to figure, figure it out as they went, mostly while they were retreating. Um, and at, at some point, they had to take all the records and send them to Philadelphia, which makes it hard to keep track of your paperwork when you're in New York or New Jersey. It explains a lot of the, the missing records that we've had to deal with. Our goal in the project has been to learn who the soldiers were um, and to learn as much as we can about their fate at the battle, um, of course. And, for many of the soldiers, we couldn't figure out very much about their lives. So the, the least we could do is to list them, list their names on, our, on the roster, or to, if nothing else, um, in, if we didn't know their names even, to include them in the tabulations of troop strength. But as much as we can, we want to know more about them. So who were their families? Um, did they have wives or children? Were they farmers? Or did they have a trade? Um, and we all want to explore how they fit into some bigger trends in American history. Um, did the economic troubles in the 1780s and 90s pull them down into debt? How many of them ended up moving to Kentucky or Ohio in search of new land to farm? Or how many of them found their way to a city like Baltimore, especially, um, 
uh, many people moved to cities. They felt that farming wasn't something they could afford to do any longer. Over the course of our work, we have uh, uncovered many wonderful, uh, many very touching stories about these soldiers. And I will talk about them a little bit later. But to begin with, I want to talk a little bit about who the soldiers were as a group who signed up in the Revolutionary War's earliest days. And perhaps what you would have seen if you had been there in Annapolis on July 9th, 1776, watching these soldiers, watching the 1st Maryland Regiment march out to defend New York. And that's what this painting shows. It's a really gorgeous thing. Um, this image doesn't really do it justice. The, the colors are much nicer. Um, it's, it's a lovely thing. It's almost completely inaccurate. Almost nothing about it is right. Um, they, they shouldn't be in those lovely blue uniforms yet. They hadn't gotten those. Um, not all of those people probably were there. And they didn't need to be on horseback because they went by water for the first part of the trip. Um, the soldiers who were in Annapolis and the ones in Baltimore all went by boat up the bay to uh, Elkton, to the head of Elk. And they didn't march until they'd gotten past that point. But it's a nice picture, and it gives you an idea of, undoubtedly, there were many soldiers in Annapolis. In, in fact, if you had been in Annapolis that summer, you would have been overwhelmed by the sheer volume of soldiers. There were somewhere around at least a thousand of them in the vicinity of Annapolis that summer um, from the 1st Maryland Regiment and other units. And it essentially doubled the city's population. And if you're, you're trying to think about what the effect of that on the city would have been, it doubled the population almost exclusively with single young men. Just imagine that for a moment in a, a town already full of taverns. There were among these soldiers only four with any prior combat experience. Two of them, Lieutenant Colonel Francis Ware of uh, Charles County, and Barton Lucas from Prince George's County had been young officers in the French and Indian War uh, way back in 1758. They fought out near Pittsburgh. Two others of them, Major Thomas Price and Private Nathan Peake, both from either Montgomery or Frederick County, had been part of a group of riflemen that Maryland had sent to Boston the previous summer, um, where they have, would have had a very limited amount of actual engagement with the British. They didn't do much fighting, um, but they had, had at least been part of an army before. Um, and none of these soldiers were there at the Battle of Brooklyn. Um, two of them were sick, and uh, Price was still in Maryland, um, and Ware was in a court martial, which we'll talk a little bit more later, um, which is, I think, really one of the most remarkable things is that there were very few experienced soldiers in the Maryland line, and none of them fought that day. The soldiers who marched out that day, they were under the command of this gentleman, Colonel William Smallwood, um, a handsome gentleman here of Charles County, who rose to be the highest uh, ranking Marylander in the Continental Army by the end of the war. All of the soldiers were men, of course, but there were likely plenty of women traveling with the army as well. Men brought their wives or even whole families at different times, and the armies attracted plenty of unattached women as well. These women cooked, washed laundry, sold supplies to the soldiers, uh, provided some medical care. The army didn't really have a functioning logistics division um, during the war. And the quartermaster corps was struggling at best. And so these, these the camp followers, this, this larger uh, army community helped provide some of those services. But for many people, it was more a simple matter of economics to bring your family. You couldn't afford to support them on your army salary, which you weren't getting, um, if you weren't home and they couldn't support themselves without you. Josiah's Carvel Hall, um, who was a colonel in the 4th Maryland Regiment, described the problem in 1779. A soldier's pay, he wrote, will not enable him to maintain a family at home, which compels him to bring them with his regiment where they may share his rations, which are little enough for himself anyway. This frequently subjects the brave soldier to punishment by so powerfully interfering with his military duties and greatly encumbers the march of the army. An experience of these inconveniences prevents the most considerate and best of our soldiers from re-enlisting. And in 1779, the army was facing a severe manpower shortage. Um, and these were the kinds of things that Hall was talking about. We know only a little bit about who these women were, at least in 1776, 
we know that one of them was Margaret Jane Ramsey, who was the wife of Captain Nathaniel Ramsey, uh, commander of the Fifth Company. And she was also the sister of Charles Wilson Peale and James Peale, both noted portrait artists. Um, James Peale was himself an officer in the regiment. She didn't travel with the army on its march to New York, but she joined it shortly after the Battle of Brooklyn, saying that she would rather be with the army, whatever might be her sufferings, than to be at a distance and so much tormented. For if she were near the army in case of misfortunes, she might possibly be able to assist those most dear to her. She traveled with the army for the whole time that her husband served, um, and he rose to being colonel, and she was essentially the Maryland officer's unofficial hostess. In addition, Sergeant William Sands of Annapolis made reference in a letter to his parents to a few women who were with the army. As for your advice, he wrote, I am very much obliged to you, but I'm very sorry anybody should raise such false reports. The girl is not in company with me. She's along with the soldiers in the barracks with five more women. I have nothing to say to her, and I hope you will not think any more of it. Sadly, we have no idea who Sands is talking about or who these uh, women were, what sorts of false reports were being raised. One can imagine they were not the sort of people who a, proper, uh, a boy from a proper family should be associating with. The soldiers were young, of course. It's an, our armies have always been filled with young men. Um, and America had a, as a whole had a pretty young population. Still, the youth of the troops is striking. Um, to me, really most striking in the leadership. That Daniel Bowie was either 20 or 21 when he was made a captain. William Sterrett and William Frazier were a pair of 19-year-old lieutenants. Nathaniel Ramsey was 35, which was a more common age for a captain, but his junior officers were 18 and 22. And what's particularly important to note is that a lot of the time these young junior officers ended up in pretty important leadership roles during the war and during battle, that um, William Sterrett was a 19-year-old lieutenant, but he commanded his company at the Battle of Brooklyn because his captain was sick and couldn't fight that day. The median age of the Marylanders who fought at Brooklyn was 24, and about 70% of the men were in their, their 20s. Um, Foreign-born soldiers tended to be a little bit older. They were about 26 or 27. Um, and the, the regiment was somewhere around 20 or 30% um, foreign-born, um, mostly Irish, as far as we can tell, some English, a handful of Germans mixed in. Um, but records about that are not very good. They're hard to work with. Or they're not hard to work with. They're just not there most of the time. Unless any of the wealthy men in the group brought their slaves with them, which is actually pretty likely to have occurred, this was otherwise an entirely white group of people. Every other infantry regiment from Maryland during the Revolutionary War was integrated, including those from 1776. Um, even the German regiment, which was raised in Western Maryland and was supposed to be open only to ethnic German soldiers or to people from ethnic German uh, families. Um, there were black soldiers in that unit as well. But as far as we can tell, the soldiers who fought with Smallwood in 1776 were all white. Simply put, in that first year of the war, the state could raise enough troops with only white soldiers, which is what the state really wanted. Um, the state was very fearful of the idea of African Americans, free or even worse, enslaved, um, being armed, which was about the scariest thing that white society could imagine in the 18th century. Um, but as the war went on, there were fewer white men who were eager, eager to volunteer, and the state was more willing to accept African-American soldiers. And they have fought in the integrated units, which is something that people don't always know about the Revolutionary War. One challenge that we have is that very often soldiers' race isn't mentioned in, in the, their enlistment records, which is, um, if, you, if you have any experience with the 18th century, this is perhaps the only time when somebody could be black and not have their race be mentioned in a record. Um, this is very frustrating. So we're going to begin by talking about the Battle of Brooklyn, and then we'll talk at the end some of the people who fought there. Um, we'll talk about some people who are, who are from uh, Hartford County while we're at it. So the Marylanders march off in the beginning of July, and they get to New York about a month later, making about 15 or 20 miles a day marching. They join the American army, which had somewhere around 10,000 men. The, the Americans were never quite sure how many soldiers they had. Um, and most of the 
Mar many of the Marylanders get there and they get sick, along with many of the other American soldiers. Um, just the Americans' ability to run an army at that time was not great. They were still learning how to do this. And so they didn't know how to properly organize an army camp to keep everyone from getting sick, from getting typhoid from close contact or dysentery from not keeping your latrines away from the water. Um, the British had been arriving in bits and pieces in the region over the course of July and August. And then on August 22nd, they land the big bulk of their troops, some 20,000 men on the southern end of Long Island, uh, near where the Verrazano Narrows Bridge is. The Americans first guess that this is a diversion, but they don't really know. They don't know how many soldiers the British have in any one place. They don't know how many British soldiers they could expect to come. They're not sure what these British soldiers are doing. And they can't really get good intelligence on it because many of the people who live in the area don't want the Americans to win. They are fairly loyal to the British um, in that area of Long Island. It's one of the reasons the British were there. It's not until August 26th that the Americans finally realize, it was the day before the battle, in case you're, you're, you're keeping track, the, that the Americans realize that this really is all of the, Amer the British soldiers and that, this, that the real attack is going to happen there um, on Long Island, in, in what we now call Brooklyn. At that time, George Washington has convened a court-martial, um, and he has you taken William Smallwood and his second in command uh, Francis Ware to be part of that military jury. And Washington doesn't want to stop the trial um, in, very in, inexplicably. Um, and so he sends the Marylanders over to, or over, over across, out from Manhattan across the East River under the command of this gentleman, Mordecai Gist. Gist was a 33 year old Baltimore merchant. He had been long active in revolutionary activities. He had founded a militia company, the Baltimore Independent Cadets, in 1774. But their activities, they had never done much more than parading or occasionally showing up uh, to menace British colonial officials. So he had no more experience than anybody else did. But he has the command and he is in charge. So I'm going to take a moment to sort of walk you through the geography of the battle um, in, in case your New York geography isn't great. Mine certainly isn't. Um, so no, here's my mouse. Okay. So um, up here, what they call New York is what we now call Manhattan. And this little shaded part is more or less the place where anybody lives. Sort of a funny thought. Um, here's the East River, which separates this area, so which is Brooklyn here, and then further out is Long Island. Um, and then over here is Staten Island and the Verrazano Narrows, um, where the bridge is now. The British are these guys in red. This is a British map. Um, your, your team was always in red. So the British were, were kind of arrayed out like this. And the Americans in blue, are a little hard to see, are sort of lined up in a semicircle this way. The Americans have a camp back here, which is very well defended. And the Marylanders are this little group right here in a blue circle. They are at the very far end, the far right of the American defensive line. So to tell the story of the Battle of Brooklyn, I could stand up here and keep talking. But the best way to do that, to tell this story, is to let the soldiers who were there describe it. Um, and we're, we're lucky. It's, it's remarkable. There are a number of very good firsthand accounts um, of the Battle of Brooklyn from Maryland soldiers who were there. And they will do a much better job than I ever could. So the guest began. We began our march to the right side of the battlefield at 3 o'clock in the morning. Um, on August 27th, with about 1,300 men from Maryland, Pennsylvania, and Delaware. And at about, at about sunrise, we discovered the enemy. This is from an unnamed soldier from the 5th Company. We don't know who he is. He was presumably one of the officers, but not the captain, we think. As he says, the enemy then advanced towards us, upon which Lord Sterling, the American general commanding that section of the battlefield, immediately drew us up in a line and offered them battle in a true English taste. The British army then advanced within about 300 yards of us and began very heavy fire from their cannon and mortars. For both the balls and the shells flew very fast, now and then taking off ahead 
Our men stood it amazingly well. Oh, I'm sorry, I skipped a, a paragraph. Our men stood it amazingly well. Not even one of them showed a disposition to shrink. Our orders were not to fire until the enemy came within 50 yards of us. It's very close, just think about that for a moment. When the British perceived that we stood their fire so coolly and resolutely, they declined coming any nearer, although they were treble our number. In this situation we stood from sunrise until 12 o'clock, the enemy firing upon us the chief part of the time. Uh, William McMillan, who was a 20-year-old corporal from uh, Hartford County, said, we had a pretty severe fight with Jaegers, who were Hessian soldiers, and it was a draw battle. There was a good many on each side killed. They retreated and we did not pursue them. Our men behaved well, said Gist, and maintained their ground until the enemy retreated about 200 yards and halted, and the firing on both sides ceased. As the British withdraw, withdrew, the Marylanders begin to feel like they've weathered their first test as soldiers. They have faced the enemy, and not just faced any enemy, but the feared British regulars. Um, and the enemy has backed down. The Marylanders have stood their ground. In truth, the attack that the Maryland troops had faced was only a diversion. And the British backed down because they didn't need to keep fighting anymore. Over the night, and then as the, Ameri as the Marylanders were fighting over on, over on this side, a group of British soldiers were marching down this road, down here like this, through this pass, which was guarded by, tradition says, four men on horseback, the Americans have forgotten to guard any more carefully, and they have marched their way down to here, and the Americans are, are now almost totally surrounded. In, in 18th century warfare, that's more or less your goal, is to surround the other guys. The main body of their army, as one of them said, by a route we had never dreamed of, had entirely surrounded us and scattered all of our men, except the Maryland and Delaware battalions. Or as Macmillan said, we were surrounded by Heelanders on one side, Hessians on the other. Um, Macmillan was himself Scottish, and so when he knew, he knew what, what Heelanders he was talking about. Um, and the Scottish troops were particularly feared because they were very eager to put down the American revolt. The Scots had had their own revolt put down um, ruthlessly by the British some 30 years before. And the Scots were eager to show the Americans what happened when you tried to rebel against the British. And so everyone begins to run away. Now, things are actually okay on the American, on the side where the Marylanders are. Even though on the other side of the battlefield, things are in complete disarray. But as Gist reminds us, being thus surrounded with no possibility of reinforcements, his lordship ordered me to retreat with the remaining part of our men and to force our way through to our camp. So they want to get to, to the fortified American camp where, where the Americans will be safe at least for a little while. So the Marylanders are going to wander, go back down this road, along to here. They're trying to get here. And so by the time they get to this area, they have to stop. We were ordered to attempt to retreat, says our unnamed soldier, by fighting our way through the enemy, who filled nearly every field and road between us and our lines. We had not retreated a quarter of a mile before we were fired upon by a party of the enemy, while the enemy upon our rear was playing on us with their artillery. Our men fought with more than Roman courage, and I am convinced would have stood until we were shot down to a man. We forced the advance party, which first attacked us, to give way. By now, the, the court martial that Smallwood is, is sitting on has ended, of course, but it's too late for Smallwood to get down to fight with his men. So he and the other officers um, are watching from the heights above the battlefield. And Smallwood later discusses how just appalled he is and how ups upset he was that he couldn't be there for, in the combat. There then remained no prospect but to surrender, talking about his, his Marylanders, or to attempt to retreat over this marsh or creek where no person had ever been known to cross. We got passage down the side of a marsh, seldom before we waded over, says our unnamed soldier, which we passed and then we had to swim a narrow river, all the time exposed to the fire of an enemy. Um, Samuel Smith, who was at that point only a 24 year old uh, captain from Baltimore, later a senator um, and a general in the War of 1812. I took my men through a marsh until we were stopped by the dam of a mill, which was too deep for the men to ford, because it was the mill pond. 
And I and a, a sergeant swam over and we got two slabs of wood into the water, which we ferried over all who could not swim. And so what's happened is they've gotten, so just zooming in a little bit on that map, they've gotten to this part of the swamp, which is the Gowanus Creek um, and some of the tidal areas nearby. Um, this is now the Gowanus Canal, one of the most polluted places in America um, and one of the most uh, expensive real estate markets in New York City, as it goes. Um, and some of the Marylanders are able to get across the swamp. And there are a couple of uh, accounts which are pretty uh, harrowing go going through how deep it was. But they get back to the camp and they're safe. But the other half don't have time to get across because while they're waiting to do so, another group of British soldiers appear. Um, and so the Marylanders have to maneuver down this road trying to find a new way back to camp. And they get about as far as where this X is. As Gist says, we were left with only five companies of our battalion, uh, the, the soldiers who couldn't get across, when the enemy returned. And after a warm and close engagement of nearly 10 minutes, our troops became so disordered that we were under the, the necessity of retreating to a piece of woods on our right. We formed and we made a second attack. But being overpowered by numbers and surrounded on all sides by at least 20,000 men, which may not quite be right, but you get the idea, we were pushed back in much confusion. The impracticability of forcing through such a formidable body of troops rendered it the height of rashness and imprudence to risk the lives of our, of our remaining party in a third attempt. And it became necessary for us to endeavor to effect our escape in the best manner we possibly could. Um, Sterling later says that they made six charges. Smallwood says two. It's hard to know. There was a, was a lot of confusion at the time. Many of the ones who, who take part in this last stand um, are not able to get, to get away. The Yist and a few others are. Um, and they are either killed or captured by the British. But the stand holds the British back for quite a while, and it keeps them busy long enough, and it lets the rest of the Americans escape. The really remarkable thing about this stand, this is the famous stand of the Maryland 400. It, it may not have been planned. They, they may not have thought when they began to, 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 take, to face the British at that moment that they were going to hold the British back. Um, it's hard to, they may not even have known that that's what was, was happening when they were doing it. But what's really remarkable isn't just that they managed to form themselves into a line to fight the British for the first time, but that they were driven back and then able to reform. That was a difficult thing for armies to do in the 18th century if they were experienced. In the Revolutionary War, many experienced veteran armies broke after that, that first time and they just ran. Um, and the Marylanders managed to reform as raw recruits and then launch a second attack. But they did take pretty heavy, pretty heavy casualties. Um, so this is the, the, the numbers from the first strength return uh, taken after the battle. And it shows you which companies were able to get away and which companies fought in that last stand. Um, the companies that got away lost you can see only a handful of soldiers. They lost between 10 and 15% of their men. You know, we're talking four or five, six people. Um, well, the ones who took part in that last stand lost anywhere between 60 and 80%. Um, as, as Samuel, Mc, as William McMillan wrote, my brother and I in 50 or 60 of us was taken. The Hessians broke the butts of our guns over their cannons and they robbed us of everything we had. They lit their pipes with our money, gave us nothing to eat for five days, and then only moldy biscuits, moldy blue, full of bugs and rotten. Um, McMillan was in the fourth company, which lost, as you can see, 80, almost 80%. They lost the highest of any company at the battle. One thing that is important to, to mention, um, sort of the, if, if you remember nothing else, that you know, there, were, there were not only 400 soldiers there, um, it was not 256 soldiers killed. You will often see that number is said sometimes. Um, that's 256 killed or captured. We don't know how many were killed, how many were captured. Um, the records were not kept very well. And the one copy of the record that told us has been lost. It's likely that many more were captured than were killed. Um, 
most of those prisoners were returned in prisoner exchanges at the end of 1776, uh, beginning of 1777. Um, although we also know that conditions on the British prisons and the British prison ships were, were terrible. Um, and the, the, the estimate is that about 50% of the Americans captured at the Battle of Brooklyn died that winter before they could, they could be returned. So just to, to quickly cover the last uh, bits of the battle, um, the next day on August 28th, the, Mer the Americans are still in their camp, so they're safe for the moment, but they won't be safe there for very long. Um, but they have a, one day of respite because there's a, a massive rainstorm which slows down the British. Um, and the British were moving very slowly at the time. They didn't want to, the, the, everyone was tired. They had had, had a very hard fight. Um, the weather was terrible. They, they knew that if they were going to attack the American camp, they were going to need to do a lot of work to build their own defenses. Um, and for, if nothing else, the British just plain thought they didn't need to hurry. They didn't really perceive much of a danger from the American army. They thought the American army was going to break and run um, when they went into battle, which is what the Americans did. And they thought that the Americans were going to keep doing so until they were uh, annihilated. And they thought they had time. Um, on the late on August 28th, early August 29th, which the picture that's happening right here, um, the Americans finally decide to go back to Manhattan. And they slip out under cover of darkness. Um, they have to be very careful because the area right offshore is patrolled by a massive British fleet. Um, and they get most of the, so they have to do it at night. And many of the Americans get back um, before nightfall, but not all of them. And so as the sun begins to rise, the Americans are still sailing across the East River and they're sitting ducks for this massive British war fleet, except that as the sun comes up, you can see that there, uh, this fog has descended. Um, the, the, the accounts are that you couldn't see more than 10 yards. You can see six yards. Um, it's, it's like a miracle. It's like something from a movie. Um, it, it is, this is, this is Dunkirk. This really, this happens in a movie, right? Um, if you've seen that movie, they talk about the fog that day, but that's what really happens here. Um, and the Americans get everyone across um, before the, the fog breaks. The rest of the, of 1776 goes pretty terribly for the Americans. They, over the course of the next few months, get chased out of uh, New York entirely and put on the run through New Jersey. Um, don't manage to have anything like success until the very end of the year. And while the Marylanders fight well in many of those engagements, um, they continue to take the brunt of the fighting. Um, they develop a reputation as some of the best troops in the army for good reason. Um, and they, they take some very heavy losses as a result. So at this point, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the people who we've learned about, some of the soldiers um, from Hartford County who, who we know about. Um, it's always nice to be able to share local stories from where I am. Um, and as, as it happens, and I swear I don't say this everywhere I go, this, this is really true. The, some of the best stories we have are, are people from Hartford County or who are, who are in a Hartford County company at least. Um, for example, uh, this gentleman, um, whose story you can see here, John McLean. John McLean was a member of the 6th Company, which was actually raised mostly on the Eastern Shore, um, sort of the, uh, the, the upper corner of the, of the Eastern Shore. Um, and the 6th Company had two soldiers named John McLean. They enlisted about a month apart, so we know that there really were two of them. And to keep them straight, in the enlistment records, they call one of them John McLean of Harford. At the Battle of Brooklyn, one, at least one of the John McLeans was captured. Uh, may, may have been both of them. That's a little uncertain. Um, about three months later, in late November, the Continental Army is being busy being chased out of New York. He was picked up by an American patrol in Westchester County, north of the city. They took him to camp where he gave a statement, which was uh, later published here. And they get a few of the details of the names wrong, but it's very clearly our guy. John McLean, John McLeon, formerly lived in Hartford County, Maryland, a soldier in Captain Peter Codians, Peter Adams is his actual name, 
company, the first battalion of that state, was taken on Long Island the day Lord Sterling was defeated. And then he was put on board one of the enemy's sloops and was compelled to enlist in Colonel Rogers Rangers, a British Army unit, with whom he has been until last Saturday when he deserted from them at Williams Tavern in Westchester. He came to Rye in New York near the Tappan Zee Bridge, for those of you who drive up 95 a lot, and he was taken up by General Wooster's militia without arms and sent to General Lee. And by him sent forward to, to Croton by General Fellows from thence to this place, who gradually make working his way up the Hudson Valley. Three other persons who say they were also taken at Long Island at the same time came off with him, with uh, McLean, having previously agreed to do so at the first opportunity. He did not know them before he joined uh, Rogers, although he has reason to believe that they were in the American army as well and were also taken at the same time. Many others intend deserting. Um, the, we have a number of uh, other examples of this uh, happening. We know at, le at least three who were captured at the Battle of the Brooklyn um, ended up in British army units. Um, it was not a choice any of them made willingly um, whether they were outright forced to enlist or whether they took um, the chance to enlist as an alternative to bring out a prison ship, which was, as, we, as we've talked about, more or less a death sentence. Um, both of those things uh, would have happened, um, and many of them did desert. Um, the British Army lost a lot of deserters. Many of the ones who deserted were American prisoners. Um, one of the two John McLeans from the company later re-enlisted. We're not sure which one of them. Um, possibly both of them did, but they had the same name, so it's really hard to tell. The British unit that McLean fought in, Rogers Rangers, um, I'll just talk very briefly, had a fascinating history of their own. They were sort of a groundbreaking uh, partisan unit. Um, one, author, one author has called them the first Green Berets. They fought at White Plains and Fort Washington in 1776. Both battles where Maryland troops also fought. So it's possible that um, after McLean was impressed into the British Army, he, he had to fight his own uh, comrades. Most of the soldiers from Hartford County who we know about, um, I'm sorry, I've lost an image. Well, that's a little embarrassing. Well, pretend that there's a muster roll here. Um, uh, a large portion uh, of the soldiers from, from Hartford County who we know about fought in the uh, fourth company, which was mostly raised here. Um, there were, of course, uh, men from other places, and we have some soldiers who, who came across from Cecil, of course. The fourth, as, as I mentioned, took the heaviest losses at the battle. Of the 65 men in the company who took the field that day, only 14 came back. They were, there was one sergeant, one drummer, and 12 privates. Um, because there were so few of them, we can actually have been able to identify uh, most of them. Um, so we know for certain that the sergeant was a man named John Toomey. The drummer was Patrick Ivey. Um, we can identify five of the privates for certain because they show up on payroll uh, from later that fall in 1776. So they must have been with the regiment. Uh, William Chaplin, Edward Cosgrove, John Herring or Herring, William Nixon and Thomas Wiseman. Um, we know a little bit about who these people were, that uh, John Toomey uh, stayed in the war um, until 1779, rising to lieutenant. Patrick Ivey stayed until at least 1779, although the end of his service isn't really very well documented. He served briefly as the 1st Maryland Regiment's drum major, so in charge of all the drummers, which is a, a pretty important post, um, but was arrested twice, once for theft, once for desertion sentenced to receive a lot of lashes as punishment, and this sort of drops off the records. William Chaplin re-enlisted at the end of 1776, but defected to the British in 1778 and returned to his native England. Edward Cosgrove served until the war's very end in 1783, um, though he was a, arrested with Patrick Ivey in 1777, was received 300 lashes for uh, theft Nixon and Heron both enlist, re-enlisted re in 76, served until 1778 when they were reported as deserters. Um, 
one thing you may be noticing the trend of a lot of people deserting. Um, people deserted for a lot of reasons. One of them is that it seems that it, when it seemed like the army didn't care about them, the army didn't pay them or feed them, um, that things in the war were going badly. Many people made what you know is fundamentally a rational choice of just going home. Thomas Wiseman stayed in the army until 1780. So he enlisted in 76 and then once more in 79. He was wounded at the Battle of Camden in 1780, um, left behind by the army as it retreated and just settled in South Carolina and lived the rest of his life there, no more than uh, um, 100 miles or so from, from the battlefield. We can also identify six other privates who were very probably who survived the, the Battle of Brooklyn. Um, Valentine Smith and John Riley, um, and Smith we know for sure was from Hartford County because he ended up owning land um, along Broad Creek. Uh, they were both in army hospitals in Annapolis in January 77. Um, John Price and Thomas Hamilton who were sick in Philadelphia in late December. Um, if they had been in the hospital at that point, they, they would not have been captured. They, would not have been gotten back from British captivity yet. And then two others, William Parr and William Baggett, um, also seem to have survived, which gets us 13 out of 14, um, which raises the obvious question, what about the rest of the company? Well, at least 11 were captured, probably many more than that. But we know the names of 11, um, only three of whom are on this particular list. This is the return of the men which were released from captivity in New York. Um, so Captain Bowie's company of these three men down here, uh, Samuel Glasgow, Robert Crawford, and Thomas, oh, I can't even, that's a little embarrassing, uh, McMillan perhaps, um, Samuel Glasgow uh, deserted twice, he's a busy guy. Um, at least two of the men in the company were known to have been killed at the battle, Daniel Bowie and his Lieutenant Joseph Butler. Bowie wrote out his will that day, uh, the day bef just before the battle, which is what you can see right here. Um, he made provisions for, as he wrote, if I fall in the field of battle. Bowie was only 20 or 21 and had only been captain of the company for about six weeks. And four of those weeks, they had been on the march from Maryland. He had been promoted just days before the regiment had departed when the old captain left to join a new, uh, join a new unit. Bowie took command of a company with only 58 men, well shy of full strength. Full strength would have been 74. Um, and they managed to recruit enough men before they left Maryland to bring it up to, to 65, but still almost 10 short of full strength and by far the smallest Maryland company at the battle. Bowie seems to have inspired his lieutenant, uh, Butler. Oh, here, I have to show this. This is the... Uh, um, so this is Bowie's original will, the actual paper that he wrote out um, that day on the battle, before the battle. Um, and you can see that he's got, the, the people who witness it are William Starrett, Brian Philpott, and Henry Chu Gaither, who were other soldiers, um, other officers in the unit. Um, and he, he made bequests to many of the other soldiers who he was with. Bowie ins perhaps inspired one of his, uh, his officers, um, as, as we read here. On August 27, 1776, when Colonel Smallwood's regiment was drawn up on Long Island in expectation to engage with the enemy, Lieutenant Joseph Butler called Ensign, or Lieutenant, Prawl and myself out of the ranks and desired that we remember if he should be so unfortunate as to be killed, that it was his desire that his brother or half-brother should receive his estate. And there's some more description. This is the account that Lieutenant Joseph Ford, who was a lieutenant in another company, gave to the Hartford County Register of Wills in October 77, so more than a year after Butler's death. Um, this was the, the only will that there was. What became of the estate uh, of his brother or the, the other people who are mentioned is not known, but it, you can just imagine this group of, uh, of young men arrayed on the battlefield in preparation for a battle um, that none of them have, have ever experienced before not showing what to do. And, and, and Butler steps out to talk to a few of his friends to, to, to settle his mind and prepare for his fate. There are some really other great stories that I could tell you about. I don't want to take up all day for you. Um, 
in fact, there is an exhibit um, at the Miller Senate Office Building in Annapolis about the Maryland 400, and it focuses on the Fourth Company and the Hartford County Soldiers. Um, it, I'm not sure if you're allowed into the building right now. One day we'll all be allowed back into buildings again, um, and you can go see the exhibit. Um, and you can learn about people like Valentine Smith, who I mentioned earlier. Um, Smith survived the Battle of Brooklyn, but fell ill. And we rejoined the army. Um, he was wounded probably in combat sometime around 1780 and spent the rest of the war in the Invalid Corps, a group of um, essentially wounded soldiers who did uh, garrison duty at West Point. Um, he drew a small pension, lived in Hartford County after the war. Um, we, we talk about Richard Whalen, who was a 22 year old private captured at Brooklyn, but managed to escape. He came back uh, to Maryland, um, made his way to Baltimore, where he enlisted in an artillery company and served until 1779. After the war, he lived in North Carolina and later Tennessee, working his way west. The most remarkable story of all, though, is about William and Samuel McMillan. And we've heard from William, from William already today, but I haven't really talked about their story at all. I've just heard some quotes from his, his, his letter. They were both immigrants from Scotland. Um, Samuel was 23, and his, William was two years younger. They had served um, in the Hartford County Militia in 1775, along with a good number of other people in the company. So these, these were men who may not have had combat experience, but certainly have had familiarity with each other, which counted for a lot. William's account from what we know comes from a letter that he wrote in 1828. It's this letter right here. Um, he wrote it to an, uh, William Clark, who was the secretary of the US Treasury, um, somebody who McMillan had encountered before. Um, and he wrote it to, to try to help smooth out some problems that McMillan was having with his pension, um, hoped that Clark would be able to pull some strings and, and help, uh, help McMillan get his money back. And to help bolster his case, uh, McMillan wrote a letter, wrote an account of his, his army service to help prove, you know, I was a soldier and I know that most of the paperwork is missing, but I can tell you about what happened and it, it, you'll have to believe me. Um, and to see the letter, you can kind of see it here, um, but to, to see it up close is to really experience, to, to, to get a sense of how McMillan wrote this letter, that it came, his story must have come pouring out of his hands um, faster than his, his hands could keep up. Like it had, had, almost as if it had been bottled up for, for years and, and finally came rushing out. I am gone on 73 years of age, he wrote, and I always have had a good state of health, but about a year ago, I was thrown off my horse and I was dead for some time. It's a little exaggeration. I broke three of my ribs. Twas a long time before I got well. I was not able to scarcely do anything. And I began to think about my revolution services. Um, we also, he also wrote another account um, of his army time to help support uh, his brother's uh, widow's pension application. Um, he talks in that one about the battle and its aftermath. He talks about how he and his brother remained on Long Island until about November after the battle. We were then put aboard of ships and sent to Halifax, where we remained until the 27th of April, 1777. It's a date that he remembers still so clearly all those years later. At that time, a group of about 10 American soldiers, including the two brothers, escaped from the British prison there. Slowly, they made their way through Nova Scotia and New Brunswick, deep into enemy territory, making, trying to make their way back home. We made our escape from the enemy and came to Shabinicade, uh, then across the Bay of Fundy, to a place called Machias. From there, we came in a sloop, so they're working their way along the coast now. Um, provided by Colonel Allen of the Massachusetts Militia to Casco Bay in the province of Maine. Um, so this is more or less, they, they sail their way to Portland. There Samuel took sick, um, and so William left him and went to Boston and joined the army there. About the 1st of August, William himself came to Boston and enlisted 
in the service again, both joining Massachusetts regiments. In, his, in, his, in this letter, uh, William continued, several times we had likely on the trip to been killed by the Indians if we had not had a man that could speak the Canadian language, um, French, several times. Once they bait their guns at us, a word we can't tell what it means, um, and this Canadian spoke their language well and kind providence saved us in that way. We were 10 weeks in the wilderness, sometimes nothing to, to eat for days, but moss that grows on the rocks in the bays, sometimes shellfish or snails. We got so poor um, and so weak, we could hardly make a trill, they could hardly whistle. It would take too much paper to give a correct account of our sufferings that we underwent. Nevertheless, they both enlisted in Massachusetts regiments. Samuel serves with his until 1780 when his term, when his term ends. Meanwhile, in 1778, right after the Battle of Monmouth, William finds himself in camp with the Maryland line, with the, with the Maryland soldiers. Um, and he joins, rejoins the Maryland troops, um, unofficially, very unofficially. Uh, Massachusetts regiment records will still show him as a deserter. Um, but William joined, rejoined the Marylanders, stayed with the Maryland line until 1783, until the war ends. Um, he said he spent the last two years of the war in Baltimore as a lieutenant recruiting soldiers. There's not good documentation of that, which is why he had to write this letter to get Clark to help him. Um, it's a really, it's a really amazing story. It's really neat. And if that was all of the story, that would be enough to say that this was a great story. But there's another chapter. After the war, um, both brothers end up in Mercer County, Pennsylvania, way up in the northwestern corner. Um, they got federal bounty land um, for their Revolutionary War service, and they, they got theirs out there. William became uh, a businessman ran a tavern, owned some houses, um, and a local politician, a local office holder. Um, the two brothers went into business together for a time, although the partnership failed. Um, they lost about $1,500 in 1819 when the economy collapsed. But you can get a sense of how well their business was if that, that they could, could lose $1,500. Um, at that time, Samuel and his family moved on. Um, he died in 1831. William and his wife and at least one daughter um, lived in Mercer until his death in 1839 when he was 83 years old. Um, the story of the McMill William and Samuel McMillan is, as I said, is remarkable. Their escape from British captivity is as vivid and dramatic as any other soldiers. And their post-war lives are perhaps even more remarkable. These two young immigrants from Scotland, just think about this, it's the American story. They become landowners, prominent citizens, polit uh, political office holders in the early days of American westward expansion. The McMillan's military service is not incidental to their achievements. It, indeed, it, it helped them gain their status, especially William's time as a commissioned officer and the benefits that they accrued from serving in the army, that their veterans land grants um, and their pensions were invaluable to their men and their family's survival. Well, thank you very much. That's all I have for you uh, for right now. Um, but I would love to hear any questions that you have. Um, I have check a couple. You can take a chance to read all of all of the stories that we have. Um, so yeah, what kind of questions do we have, Mary? Okay, the first one is from Carol Bickle. Uh, she asked, was Mordecai Geist related to Christopher Geist of Pennsylvania? Um, the short answer is yes. Um, and I'm going to pause for a second to see if I can remember. I am not certain. I, I don't remember how they're related. Um, but Mordecai Gist in that group, um, his family came from what is now Carroll County. Um, so not far from Pennsylvania. And so the two families are connected. Um, there were a couple of other Gist officers in the Continental Army during the war. Um, who were all cousins, at least, if, if not more than that, I, I can't remember more. But if you send me an email, I may be able to look that up for you. 
Okay, and Christopher Smithson asks, why was the percentage loss higher than the full strength for Captain Bowie and Adams? Um, so they lost, and I don't have the, the number of men that they lost. They lost, um, they, they lost 80% of the soldiers they had, but the full strength would have been about 75 men. So the, the, the graph is a little unclear. I apologize for that, but they did not lose more than they had. Okay, and the last question, did any of the pay stubs survive for the two John McLean? Um, one of the prisoner uh, records did. Um, I meant to show you this. This I apologize. This I, I missed a couple of images when I was putting my presentation together. Um, but yes, one of them does. It's the list of back pay. So it is similar to. Let me go find it. So there's another. There are a couple of other lists very similar to uh, this one, um, which are. Just show the list of soldiers getting their back pay after they were they got back from captivity, and in the one for the sixth company just says John McLean. And it could have been one or both of them, and it's so hard to know, and it's really frustrating. You, know, you run into people with the same names like that. So, um, just to, to to say one other thing is, these are when I was I talked at the beginning about how. There are muster rolls um, and, and serve recorded service records, but there are also these kinds of pay records, um, which are some of the most important when you're trying to tease out the details of a soldier's service. Um, and if you want to know about in what happened to an individual, um, these things really tell you a lot more than you can learn just from looking at the you know enlisted 1776, discharged 1779. These tell you a real story to go along with sort of those, those, those outlines of their dates. Okay, thank you very much. And, well, uh, wonderful. Yeah, thank you all so much. Um, thank you, Mary, for helping to uh, feed those questions to me. If you go to the website, um, if you go to that, to that web address, there will be a place you can find my email. Um, and please send me any questions that you have um, about the Maryland 400 or about uh, doing this kind of research. I've been doing it for a long time, so I'm always happy to help other people use it.